All right. Welcome one. Welcome all. This is the Sight Sound Spirit Group. And this is a series of Zoom conferences called Science and Spirituality. And today I want to introduce Naminder Singh and David Chavanthong. And I am going to ask that both of you, we'll start with Naminder, um, introduce yourself and just sort of give us some background as to where you're coming from and what interests you. So go ahead, Naminder, take, sure. it, take it away. Thank you, Michael, for giving the opportunity. And um, Naminder Singh, I'm from the UK. Um, from my appearance, you can probably tell I'm from a faith of Sikhism. This is my background. However, my views are not just Sikhism. I like to look into a lot of other faiths and do a lot of interfaith stuff. Um, I'm quite aware of a lot of the other faiths and beliefs. Um, my background is um, in IT. I'm an IT tech geek. And I also have a big interest in um, mental health issues and awareness. And I do a lot of things like that and a lot of community work. So I'm quite involved in the community. I also do radio work. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it really. Awesome. Well, welcome. Thank you. David, um, tell us yep. a little bit about yourself and just in case somebody is watching this series for the first time. Okay, right. I'm David Chantavong. This is my second time with Michael here on his series. Uh, my background is, uh, in, in terms of study, it's uh, majority Buddhism, but I do study all the all the other major religions. Also, I am a CNC machinist by trade. That's what I do for a day job. And I run Facebook groups on um, spirituality and science and spirituality, pretty much. And that's pretty much how me and Michael met, is through these groups. Yeah. And, and the Minder. Yeah. And Sam, yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I, I apologize. I already, I just now realized that I mispronounced your name, David. Um, Bear with me. Um, I also have sort of a weird sounding last name that a lot of people mispronounce. So I've just learned to accept that. And uh, I, I totally appreciate both of you gentlemen uh, participating. And I look forward to this conversation. I'm going to give a little quick background on myself. Uh, I consider myself to be a philosopher. I basically study everything. Uh, I love science. I love uh, what I've learned from various religions and faiths. And I view everything basically from a standpoint of it being information. So I, I think, uh, Naminder, you and I are going to be great friends because um, I, I totally love and understand computer technology and um, just everything in regards mm -hmm. to, again, information. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm doing is I'm I'm obtaining information, even as we speak, I'm processing it, and I view myself to be sort of a, uh, an organic synthesizer, whereas these computers are synthetic organizers. So I see the parallels and I make the connections. Uh, Naminder, tell us a little bit about uh, Sikhism. Okay. Um... Founded around um, 1500, 1469 was when Guru Nanak, who was the founder, uh, was born. So it's a fairly recent faith. Um, as for a religion, I personally, and I think a lot of Sikhs, don't class it as a religion as such. It's more of a, a spiritual path and a, a way of sort of reaching the higher levels into consciousness and um, a lot of bringing clarity to a lot of the teachings of the other faiths as well. And um, the teachings are a mix of um, Hindu, Bhagats, um, Sufi, Islam Sufi teachings and the gurus themselves and a lot of Bhats, which was like the higher priests in India. So it's a, it's a collection of all their teachings put into our, we class it as a living guru, which is the Guru Granth Sahib. And so it's, although it's a written collection of them, it's actually a spiritual portal 
that um, we believe as you're reading, you are connecting. So it's very much a spiritual faith rather than just prescri prescriptively just follow this, follow that. It's a, mm. it's a connect, connect with the oneness. So it's all about oneness. And in a nutshell, what is quite far spreading started in India, in Punjab. So that it's from the whole region, actually, in where Pakistan is now. It was originally Punjab. Okay. And um, just after, it was before the divide, obviously it's all divided now. And yeah, it's, it's about oneness. And the, the very first um, letter and wording is ik onga, which means one, um, one creator. I'm not going to use the word God because the word God has been used many times, but we don't. That's fine. We don't class it as God. <laughs> it's a creator. Okay. Yeah. Fair so enough. I love that. Super duper. Uh, David, let me. Uh, have you uh don't forget to unmute yourself and yeah. then um give me just sort of and you know when, when we ask for sort of a, a something in a nutshell and we're talking about we we, we all understand that yeah. really all of the different religions and faiths and philosophies i mean we're, we're talking a huge amount of information so mm -hmm. it, it can be a challenge to kind of sort of condense it but Give me maybe just uh, your perception and interpretation of what Buddhism is, and we'll just start there. Okay. Well, Buddhism, um, it's focused pretty much on, well, the Buddha's first sermon, he was all, it was about the Four Noble Truths, and, and that, that involves suffering, uh, the cessation of suffering, and following the noble eightfold path and realizing the uh, realization of suffering pretty much so everything in this world this 3d this place we call earth it's full of suffering not only just earth but all the realms because all the realms are impermanent you might live like a few billion years in the heavens but once that is up you have to come right back to earth or to the animal realm or to the ghost realm to uh, do it all over again, you know, you know, until you reach enlightenment. So the whole, the whole uh, point of Buddhism is to escape this cycle of death and rebirth called samsara. And samsara is pretty much, um, it includes all the realms of existence. The only realm of existence that's um, free of samsara, that's not inside this cycle, is nirvana. And like I said before, you, there are many higher realms, six heavens, seven seven Brahman Four formless realms, you got the animal realm, the, the realm of hungry ghosts, you got the realm of the Asuras, which is the demigods, and then you got the realm of the hell beings, which is Naraka in Pali, in Buddhism. That's what we call hell. Oh, and also the, the purgatory, which is Krita Loka. That's right next to the hells, actually. So these are all the realms of existence that we are trying to escape by uh, following the Dharma, the Noble Eightfold Path. And, and that's, that's exactly, if you follow it to a T, um, you will pretty much um, remove all the obstacles, obstructions, the fetters in your mind. And you're in your, that's in your consciousness since birth. And you will ascend to higher realms and hopefully to Nirvana, Nirvana eventually. Because you might, you know, heavens, they're considered desire realms well that's not the that's not the goal of a buddhist the goal of a buddhist is to go to nirvana which is above the heavens so yeah the buddhism is pretty much all about escaping the cycle of death and rebirth as explained hmm. by the yes uh let me ask for a little bit more clarification on one term that jumped out and i i believe it you said um you spoke about sansara is that pronounced correct <laughs> Lee? I'm sorry. Okay, let me let me ask um, for you. Uh, or let me ask one question, uh, yeah. and it seems like quite a a lovely coincidence that sensara and the word sense are very similar. So, is there a correlation? 
No, because these are uh, these are words in two different languages. Samsara is in uh, Pali and Sanskrit, and okay. it, it pretty much denotes the cycle of death and rebirth. That includes it goes deeper. It includes all the realms of existence. So samsara yeah. is is another name for that cycle. Yeah, it's actually the name for that cycle. Yeah. Oh, okay, got it, got it. So yeah. how how do you experience reality? Um, if and not the, through, if not through the senses. Well, I mean, that's, that's a good question. If you're not in Nirvana, then you're always going to have some senses because we have senses through physical bodies, right? Uh, whatever body that we're in, whatever realm that we're in, we get a different body in every single realm. It's not right. a, the only time we have a human body is in planet earth. In the heavens, you have a celestial body, like I said in the previous one. A celestial body of a deva and is not born from a womb, but you're manifested from thin air into a, this celestial body that knows no pain, no hunger, no suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, in contrast to a human body, which does experience these things aging, illness, suffering from beginning to end. And it, you don't have that body in the heavens. So everything is all, everything is all good to go in the heavens. It's all, it's, it, it's a, it's a realm of desires, like a desire realm in a, in a good way, but it's, it's also the lowest of the divine realms in the heavens. Um, in the heavens, you get pretty much whatever you want. It's based on your, your previous life. It's not um, predetermined by a superior being called God or uh, creator. No, it's determined by you. you know? Every single realm you enter, including Earth, is determined by you. It's not is not predetermined by a higher being but you are the being that de determines that pretty much so oh. that would be that would be sort of um how free will works yeah is that exactly well, okay. because we have free will and this is exactly why uh we are in these current realms of existence with physical bodies a different kind of body we experience different things in different realms like, right. for example, the Brahma realms that are on top of the six heavens, some of these beings, they don't have five senses. They have only three, you know, because they enjoy the bliss of having just three senses. They don't, they ignore the, uh, the other two human senses or whatever. May I ask what the, I, I have an idea that two of those three would have to be sense, uh, a sense of, of sight and a sense of sound. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. What, what would be what would be the third sense in, in that particular the being? The mind would also would always have to be the sense. That, okay. You know, the mind is considered the sixth sense in Buddhism. Other I love than, that. I love know, that. Yeah, I love that. Uh, Naminder, let me ask you: uh, What is your understanding of, or maybe interpretation of perception? And how, how valuable is that ability? Okay. Um, well, perception is from the person. Obviously, everyone's got their own point of view of looking at everybody else. So one thing that I often do and is, is taught is to be the observer. So if you take, if you look at yourself in the situation you are in and actually step back from it and look at what you are doing, and perceiving that other person. So you're not fully aware of what the other person or the other being is, what's going on inside them. Mm -hmm. And because you're not aware of it, you often have preconceptions and judgments upon them. So by, by taking yourself away and out of that situation, your perception can change quite rapidly because if you don't judge the other person and you don't think that they are already in this way, maybe somebody's acting angry towards you work out what has caused that and what's actually at the root of it is it because all these emotions and things and these feelings and everything we're feeling are moments in time and they, yeah. they always have they always have a reaction or something that comes to trigger this thing so so my the way i perceive things is i always try and um keep it sort of neutral and you know, look at is that the normal person every day, or is that the person 
today because of something that's happened to them and get to know the real person. So that, that's very important in perception. I love that. I love that. I came up with a new concept. Um, I call it neutral observational perception, and it has to do with sort of finding our balance. It has to do with another concept called zero point energy, where I feel uh, is the, I'm going to say best only because of the sake of argument and conversation. Um, actually, it's not even really for the sake of argument because the art of conversation um, has everything to do with how we learn everything. We, we cannot learn anything unless we have the conversation and every interaction, whether it's done where you are using your vocal cords or maybe even just picking up, you know, an inanimate object and having a conversation with that. It all comes down to first and foremost, a willingness to learn. So if we have an open mind yep. and we can have a perfectly open mind at our zero point, because from there you can literally change your angle at which you are viewing in a 360 degree sphere. So even though I, I, I feel that a lot of people are trying to escape from the 3D world, we can still learn something from it. So three-dimensional space where we can basically choose our coordinates and each coordinate is an opportunity to begin the learning process. Mm -hmm. So a big part of, of what I've done with my work and my writings is um, I've studied neuroscience and am learning to understand what a neurotransmitter is, for example. And I'm making these connections all in my consciousness where I can quantify the realities of our existence. And yet I'm, I'm also becoming more aware of the non-physical realms as well, which are seemingly occurring simultaneously. So I like to think of things um, from, at least from a scientific standpoint of being, uh, of there being two hyperstates of existence, physicality and non-physicality. Um, David, okay. what are your, what are your thoughts on, on, on that or those ideas as far as, and again, it seems to be connected back to perception. It, it feels like well, that word um, perception is, is just so valuable. It is definitely, but it's also part of the five aggregates too. You know, I mean, that's something that uh, brings you into existence when you cling to perception, but um, I agree with you. Yeah. And um, in uh, classifying and categorizing pretty much the, the realms, physical and non-physical, that's exactly how it pretty much is actually, but the heavens are actually a physical form in a another dimension. It, it would appear to be non-physical to us on Earth because as we can't see it, mm. you know. But um, other dimensions they have different kinds of matter. Okay, it does, it's not the same kind of matter as Earth. It's actually the higher you go, the actually uh, 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 the matter and the material that's there are actually more refined, pretty mm. much, and it's very different. Like as like. For example, when they um, speaking of these heavenly mansions called Vimanas in Buddhism, uh, you can find this in the scripture called Vimanavatu. And they describe these flying mansions as uh, they're made of several different kinds of materials, metals, alloys. And some of these alloys, when they describe it, they say it's so pure, like the purest gold that is almost clear as crystal quartz. You don't see that kind of those kind of metals on Earth, okay? These are metals that are found in other dimensions, then, pretty much. Wow. Yeah. So physics in itself and science in itself, everything is different in every single dimension, pretty much. You know, you have its own different kind of matter. And, um, you have its own different kind of laws of physics in every single dimension. Because in in the heavens, 
the beings up there. Okay, if you were be to if you were to be were to be born in heaven, you you would be a deva. Every being that's in heaven is considered a deva, whether higher or lower status. But because you're in heaven, so it's just, it's just like what uh well in in the biblical or Abrahamic religions they would be considered angels. I guess that's the closest thing to a heavenly being. Awesome. Yeah, and these beings are flying everywhere. They fly all around in the sky from place to place. They also fly from their mansions, their vimanas. So gravity in itself is not the same as gravity on Earth, you know what I mean? Because the less density, the lower realms that you, you end up in, like Earth, the, the, the higher the density. That includes our bodies and physical matter. And then you go to the lower realms, like the hells is even more dense. Our bodies are even more dense than these human bodies as well. So the lower you go, the more dense um, the, the state of physicality, the state of you know matter itself becomes more dense. And the higher you go, the lighter you become, eventually becoming the nothingness itself, like the four form, formless realms above the 17 uh, Brahma realms. And, and Nirvana is, uh, is kind of described as a state of in-between existence and non-existence. And it's void of all anything um, suffering, anything to do with suffering, pretty much. Um, anika, which is impermanence. Yeah, that's exactly what it means. Impermanent. Everything is impermanent. Whether you're in, you're in the heavens or the hells, no, you, don't, you don't stay there for forever. It's for a long time, well, it's based on, well, the hells are based on your outstanding karma, how much you have to, how much time you have to put in in hell before you get to get a chance to come back to earth and do it all again, pretty much. So, but when your time's up and when your time time is expired in the heavens, you actually have to come back down to earth as well and do it all again. And that, there's a risk in that because when you're in the lower realms, it's very hard to ascend and enlighten yourself again. You know what I mean? You have to, every existence, you you go to a brand new state of consciousness along with a stream of uh, your previous karma combined. So every every new rebirth, you are a new person. Essentially, you are and you aren't, depending on how much karma you, you still have. You know, and people that are able to trace um, their memories to past lives, they're tracing their karma, their previous karma, pretty much, because you know we're obviously still here on Earth, on Earth and in these realms of samsara existence. Um, awesome. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wow. You're, you're a new person in every world. A uh, new, you, have, you have a new state of consciousness with existing previous karma. Yeah. Two two things um, that that came to mind. Yeah. And then and then I want to ask Naminder a question. Um, first thing is um, you were t you were talking earlier about density. Yep. And. And it just dawned on me um, to to become more enlightened is yeah. to basically become less dense, uh, yeah. and you know. And yeah. so the idea of of ascending is and and floating, um, yeah. it, it's all connected. Exactly. The, the, se the second thing that I was thinking about uh, uh, Anika and 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 the whole idea of impermanence yeah. uh, is there, there's there's two uh, two things. Um, one of the Greek philosophers, Heraclitus, came up with this concept of, and, and I believe the quote is, um, uh, the, only const the only constant is change. So another word for constant would be permanence. So the only permanence is impermanence, as, as it were. And then exactly. the, other, the other thing that I've, I, I, and I had made the connection before, because as I, as I study all of these different things, I, I basically write about them. So I've, I've, I've written about Anika, for, uh, for example. Uh, Anika, is it pronounced Anika? I think it's Anika. Anika, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, so the whole idea of impermanence became better understood by, we'll call it modern day science, yeah. uh, with the uh, concept of, the first law of thermodynamics, which is energy is neither created nor destroyed. It simply changes from one state of being to another. So it just seems like there is 
we're heading towards uh, sort of a reunification of science and spirituality because even oh. even the Greek philosophers before we use the word science, they they studied natural philosophy. They they and natural philosophy is just the study of nature, yeah, and it, it includes it yeah. includes mathematics and geometry, and and sound and and all of these things that we now consider to be physics. So physics is really just the study of physical matter. That, that's all yeah. it is. That's what I, it, I mean, what it is. Um, philosophy, I like to look at it as it's the fruit of higher knowledge, pretty much. It's the fruit awesome. of all that. I love philosophy because of that. So yeah, I'm a fan of Plato and Socrates as well. Good, I, good. I do study their uh, literature. Naminder, let me ask you, what is your perception of dimensions? What, what are, from your understanding, what are, what are dimensions? Um, well, in, in my own experience and through meditation and also through the teachings, dimensions are simply, as we've talked about, less dense. Um, existences so you have just as um david's talked about the realms we've also got the concept of realms but they're less defined so the realm that we're currently in is the the realm of uh, dharma which is religions and earth and this this realm is a dense realm of learning and it's a school of learning so here we go through our lessons so that we can in effect cleanse ourselves and have a lighter body and even as through meditation and approaching like the different states of consciousness. So there's like four states and then the top, the fourth state is, um, it's like the one before you reach like Nirvana, we've got the same concept of Nirvana. And um, you, once you reach that stage, you are of nobody, you basically merge, you merge your conscious, consciousness with the higher, supreme consciousness if you want to say in effect so you reach these stages by leading a good life and um, cleansing your karma and actually taking all the good things in life and showing love love is um, a key concept in the bottom of it so these are the levels so we are we are in the dense realm and to us really this is what we call hell this this earth is hell in effect that there isn't a whole concept of hell with a, a demon god bashing your head in type of thing it, it's more of a this, this is your hell for your lessons learn your lessons and until you learn that lesson it repeats so you'll find in life <laughs> the the lesson will keep repeating if you haven't yeah. learned it one from one person a week later another person will do the same thing to you and you'll be like why am i getting double slapped at the moment and that's the reason, because the lesson of consciousness is repeating to say, well, learn your lesson and move on and improve yourself. And when you meditate, you, you reach these levels of consciousness, which um, they're basically, you're tapping into how I can describe energy. So you, you're tapping into this universal energy, the flow of the universe that comes within you and it's, it has that cleansing effect. Is in effect clean, is taking the crap out. That's the that's the best way I can describe. Yeah, I mean, all of what you guys are saying make it just it just makes perfect sense to me. Um, and I think the reason why is because I am currently as open minded as I can possibly be in this current state of existence it seems like we all have those moments of clarity and once we understand that everything that we do everything that we think everything that we say everything is there for a reason and if it's there for a reason and it's meant to be 
then the chances of every experience occurring are exactly 100%. So mm -hmm. if, and, and David, let me ask you, um, I think a lot of us are familiar with what it means to feel stuck. What, what, when, when you feel stuck, what do you think is actually happening? Um, no, pro no progression. You've, you've, uh, you've settled down with contentment, with uh, your current state of being. That's being stuck. And you're not pursuing uh, spirituality or spiritual practices that will make you literally lighter in, uh, in uh, your physical body, pretty much. You're, you're stuck. Well, you're stuck. Pretty much because you're, you, like I said, you're, you're, you're content in your current world. You're content with what you know. You're content with your current state of being. You believe this is all real, and you believe that pretty much uh, nothing is higher than this. Actually, um, like I said, it comes down to being comfortable with what you know. And when, if you're too comfortable with what you know, you think that's all there is, then you, there's no progress. You know. There's no progress at all. So there's always a continuous state of learning and refinement until you right. reach the final goal, which is nirvana. Um, yeah, there's uh, Sikhism and Buddhism is very similar uh, in a concept as well. They share a lot of the same concepts. I mean, just to um, say for me, for us being stuck is you're not doing what you're here to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You basically, you're not following your life path. In effect, was it's not written down to a T that you're going to do this today, that today, that today. But what you need to learn through that life and what where you need to get to, you're not going there. So yeah. that's when you get stuck. It, it's um, your energy is out of alignment with where you should be, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. You, you are, however, choosing that. And, and I, I like what you said, David, it's, it's, you know, I think, um, and, and I'm going to use the word certainty. I, I feel like consciousness, our, our consciousness or all consciousness, um, God's consciousness, um, the, the, the consciousness of the water in this bottle and the bottle itself all simply wish to know more. So how do you know when you know? And that, that was the title of my presentation uh, today in, in the Sight, Sound, Spirit group. H how, and it was called How to Know When You Know. And when, you, when you don't, when you, when you have no doubt at all about the current knowledge that you have obtained. When, it, when there are no falsehoods, there's no room for confusion. Um, right. That's exactly when you know, uh, when, you're, when your knowledge is correct, there's no room for falsehood, pretty much. And you, and you feel that there's no sense of falsehood as well. You know, it could be confirmed. Well, you could, it could be confirmed by perception and observation. When you observe things, you pretty, you're looking for, you're looking for, uh, confirmation you know when you observe when uh you're learning and you're also look, looking to confirm as well pretty much that's when you uh that's that's a mode of observation so that's when you know when you know when you have what no does, about your knowledge yeah when when you have no doubts when you have no confusion naminder mm -hmm. What does that feel like to you? So when you know you are happy and the door is just open for you. So where that door was closed before, it's open. And your life flows. So I actually read this in Tao Te Ching as well, which was quite good. And it talks about the flow of life. And we also have a flow. Um, we call it the Nam, which is the same thing as the Tao. And um, when it's flowing, you can just flow through life. And when you're doing the right things, there's no obstruction, there's no obstacle. Your energy can basically flow right through because that is the right thing. And you, you, you become attuned to it in effect. 
that makes perfect sense. Let me let me ask both of you, David, starting with you. Yeah. You've you've both described what you're thinking about. How does that thought process where you seem to resolve the confusions and the chaos, what does it feel like? What does it feel like to resolve the confusion and chaos? It feels great. It feels great to come out of confusion. You know what I mean? It feels great to have confirmation of your own knowledge through whoever, maybe it could be someone else, someone else could confirm it for you or even a higher being through states of meditation. You know, sometimes you get visual transmissions. I mean, if you're really in touch with uh, the spiritual realm like that, you know, you get contacted by other beings from these different dimensions too. Um, you, yeah, it feels great. It feels great to come out of confusion because confusion in Buddhism is considered suffering. You know, it's a mental suffering, you know? Correct. Yeah, and yeah. it's also considered a sin to actually, when, you know, to actually engage in conversation that confuses people, to actually speak in a way that confuses people, that's considered bad, very bad. You know, we, we avoid that. We refrain from that kind of speech. So, so, so what you're saying is if you purposely... Yeah, purposely, there you go. Try to confuse somebody... For That's your fun. own enjoyment purposes, that would uh, that would seem to be uh, creating more suffering for yourself. Would you not agree? Absolutely, because everything that everything you give out, you get back in return. So, yeah, hundred you know, percent correct. Yeah. Naminder, Naminder, let me ask you. And and again, I'm I'm asking these questions um, for a reason, and yeah. both of you are brilliant and communicate very very well Thank you. what how would you describe that those those feelings of that that occur when you resolve these conflicts and, and issues and problems how, how how would you describe those feelings we have a, a particular term in Sikhism called anand which which translates to bliss and this isn't just bliss of your normal bliss or I'm feeling happy. This is an over energy and excitement, happiness, an explosion of energy to say, I am so happy. It's like when you help somebody and you know that you get a feeling back that you've done something good and you, your whole vibration and energy lifts and raises. And this is this is the whole concept to reach that state and keep in that state all the time. So I love it. The word, the word is bliss. I love it. I love it. One of the things that I sort of realized earlier today um, is this word called relief. To me, it's it's a relief. Hmm. And when we express ourselves freely, that is a release that is also a, a relief. And when we understand that relief means to relive, then it seems like we're getting closer and closer to understanding basically whatever we want whenever we feel those relieving feelings those those blissful and yeah we can say peaceful i like uh there's another word that i really love serenity i i love the feeling of serenity and i used to be very attached to sort of the more passionate and aggressive uh types of feelings as well i have I have a lot of Irish blood in me and also uh, am aware of my Viking ancestry. And, you know, these, these people were, were very passionate, very spirited and, you know, very aggressive and, yep. you know, Yahoo, you know. Um, it's interesting, too, when we review sort of uh, our own uh, genealogy, our own history, uh, what, whatever, whatever cultures we are um, 
descended from it, it it's just uh to to be a descendant of really any culture seems like such a gift it's such an opportunity to uh just just to connect to how people lived and how people are currently living it, it just seems like such a a wonderful opportunity this experience on earth uh what what uh what would you gentlemen say is the the answer to this question why, why do we exist on earth david let me let me ask you first and then i'll have naminder follow up all right um well we exist on earth through the craving because from nothing came everything uh we have karma and in, in the, the Abrahamic um, equal to that would be sin. You know how they say you're born in, you're born with sin. Well, we're born with karma. And, and that's, that's exactly what they were talking about, pretty much. There's the parallel between the Abrahamics and the Dharmics. And the more karma you have, the more dense your body is. You know what I mean? And the, the more karma you have, in, the more lower in the realms of existence you will, you will be in, <laughs> you will be at, pretty much. So the less, the less karma, the less, uh, the less physical density, pretty much, and that's that's why we exist because of curiosity, because of desire, and desire leads to suffering, and suffering leads to lower realms of existence. And to come out of that, we have to practice, in Buddhism at least, uh, virtues, known as the Noble Eightfold Path, and that's just not limited to that. It's very complex. It gets very deep too, especially for monks. They got precepts to follow. They have uh, meditation that they must do every day. You have to wake up at like 3 a.m. and meditate every single day. I did that. And man, it's, it's, it's arduous, very arduous. You know, it's, if you're not used to that kind of practice and environment, it's going to be very tough for you. But it's... You have to be devoted, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's super valuable. Once and you don't realize this until you exit from the temple, from you disrobe, you don't realize it till after. That it's how valuable it is and how transformative it is. And that's the whole point. That's the whole point. Transmutation from negative mm. to positive. That's exactly what it's all about. So then that would be basically a summation of the answer. Why do we exist here on earth? Tra transmutation. Exactly. Yep, exactly. Naminder, what what is your uh, what are your thoughts or ideas or feelings oh. regarding the question, why are we here on Earth? Um, I was I was following similar to Buddhism. Um, we, we believe in the karma and the reincarnation. Um, we call it the cycle of 84, 84 million species that you go through before you reach the top existence of a human being. And as a human being, is your only opportunity to reach the higher states of consciousness and actually merge with super consciousness. And on this earth, we are here to learn. So um, it's, it's basically written on our foreheads what we're here to do. And as we're here, that, those are our life lessons we have to go through. And while controlling our ego, our lust, our anger, our attachment to things and our greed. So these these are the five like um, evils that we have to get rid of. And then we have five virtues, love, humility, truth, contentment, compassion. And these are the things that we have to bring in ourselves to better ourselves and better our soul in effect so that it can merge back to the creator. Awesome. A re yeah. a reemergence, if you will. Yeah, yeah, basically. Uh, I, I would kind of like to see and maybe do me a favor, Naminder. Could you message me uh the the did you call them sins? Five evils and then the five, five virtues. Five do me a favor, message me though each of those five. I want to just play uh, sort of a game yeah. and see if I can match one with the other to see if they are mirror reflections. Um, I, I just had that thought pop into my mind. So um, they are, they are, uh, I'll let you play the game. <laughs> okay, super. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I kind of thought they might be. Um, yeah. It's important when we're studying 
when we study religions, faiths, philosophies, or schools of thought, I mm. feel that it's important that we come to our own conclusions. Now, that doesn't mean that, for example, uh, if, Naminder, you're telling me about cer certain concepts ab about uh, Sikhism, or David, if you're discussing some of the concepts about Buddhism, when, when you gentlemen who obviously know about these things share it truthfully and, and just with the utmost sincerity and, and even uh, humbleness to a certain degree, um, it resonates with others because it makes sense. Now, if, for example, either one of you talk about a certain concept and I wish to understand it even more, then I think it's, it's up to me to do my own research, to come to these deeper sort yeah. of realizations about why yes. those are important. So one of the, um, so, so my religious background is uh, Presbyterian, which is a form of Christianity, which is also sort of, a, a, I'm going to call it a branch of Catholicism. And it's interesting because uh, my biggest issue with basically all of the, the, the Catholic or Christian-based ideas is the concept of do this <laughs> or else you're going to hell for an eternity. So that, you know, that just like just didn't, that just didn't cut it. It just, you know, right there was like, yeah. okay, so, yeah. so, so that, that belief, it, it serves a purpose and I understand why, but it also prevented me. It did not give me the desire to become a member of that particular church. So, so therefore I just decided to, you know, go on my own journey and seek out the truths and the wisdom of really every Every religion that I'm going to uh, encounter or hear about uh, is meant for me to better understand. And therefore, I've come to my own conclusions about really everything that I have ever studied. Now, that doesn't mean, for example, that I know everything that there is to know about quantum mechanics. I'm still learning about that. I'm learning about quantum electrodynamics. Uh, I'm learning about even just classical physics and relativistic physics. Uh, every day I'm thinking about these things because I feel like those schools of thought, those branches, uh, those particular branches of science are, are important, but no, they're not, they're not more important than the spiritual aspects and understandings and philosophies and faiths either it seems like it's up to us to decide you know which concept that we're going to better understand and i think that that again goes back to the whole idea of free will we we can freely choose what we wish to experience in order to better understand our relationship with the universe how does how does how does that sound, Dave? That sounds great. You know, it's all a learning experience. That's exactly why we're here. Everything that's we see that and feel and experience, it's all information. It's all a lesson. How you take it in, and how you and what you give out as well, um, and what you do with that information internally, pretty much. You know, what are you going to do with all this? You know, all all this information that's presented to you. Are you going to attach to it? Are you going to indulge in it? You know, you're going to indulge in pleasures or you're just going to observe it and study it and, and see what the cause and effects of that is, are pretty much. Um, it's all method. Everything, well, it's all, it's all a lesson and there are different kinds of methods of how you interpret, the, uh, interpret and use these lessons to improve yourself. There's different methods of that, methodology. And every school, every religion has different methods of how to deal with these types of things and concepts, negative to positive, and how to, you know, how do you how do you reach how to reach higher states and higher realms? There's all methods with that. Um, mm -hmm. 
So yeah, the, all this experience is all it's it's all lesson, it's all information. Like you, you've always been saying, I agree with you. Yep. Um, uh, Michael, you used a particular word, which was seeker, and the word seek actually means disciple, and it also means a seeker of truth. So, I love it. And this is what Sikhs are really, this is why I don't really think there's a religion, it's a, a person who is seeking the truth. And, th and this is what you've described to me, that you you were brought into a certain religious faith background, but you weren't happy with it, so you were seeking the truth. That makes you a Sikh, in effect. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I never, um, until right now, understood the relationship but it's all it all all goes back to the sound and um even david with um the word that we were discussing earlier uh Anika. censura no oh, no, no. censura yeah yeah so so you said no there's no connection because it's two different languages i believe the connection to all of the words that have a similar sound are actually intentional. I, I believe that that human beings basically have been retelling these different stories. And yeah. as we progress through our own evolution as a species, the sounds remain the same. And yeah, there's going to be changes in the translation or the meanings of words. Uh, what's interesting is that we are currently using this language called English. And the English language, I believe, is wonderfully amazing and beautiful because of how it sounds and because it employs several different other languages. Yeah. And... To me, it's important also to first recognize and respect the value of the written language while also understanding that, that when you speak it and you use sound to convey sort of these deeper meanings, both are valuable. And it, it just... It just what I think about and yeah. and I'm also understanding that what I think about I bring about and and it's because of you know we talk about in in Buddhism um you know the whole idea of desires and one of the things that that I sort of uh got stuck is in the paradox or the idea of if I become detached to everything, I will no longer suffer. So I always take things to an extreme. And what I did was subconsciously sort of bring about a different level of suffering without even realizing it. And, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. funny because, well, first of all, it's funny because it's true. Um, I, have, uh, uh, I have some conditions. I call them mental conditions. I don't think of them as illnesses i don't think of them as disorders uh, they're 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 conditions they're they're symptoms to a certain extent um those include um ocd adhd depression and addiction so i am a recovering addict i've been clean since july 6th of 1995 uh, i have not participated in any alcoholic um uh, or drugs or you know, even, even marijuana, which a lot of people still find uh, a lot of value and usefulness. Um, it, is, it is medicinal. Um, I learned what I meant, was meant to learn from all of those things, including LSD. I used to do a lot of acid uh, back in um, 1992. And I sort of collapsed that experience into just a very relatively short period of time, just basically a couple of months. And as I recall, it was approximately something like 21 trips where, whew, man, I, I opened up some portals and 
had some hallucinations and even uh, some psychotic breaks with reality where I, I was presented with some very valuable information. And the first time I basically lost my mind, uh, it was both uh, terrifying and terrific at the same time. So it became pretty clear to me that as a human being, we don't have to maintain any particular state of existence past its expiration date. So the expiration date, sort of like uh, what we see on milk that we buy, um, if, if you don't pay attention to the expiration date and you drink that milk after it's spoiled, you're, you're going to get sick. It's going to feel quite horrible. So I think the same thing applies to basically any of the experiences. It's okay to um, appreciate the experience. It's okay to acknowledge its importance. But once you learn what you were supposed to learn from it, it's also time to move on to something new, something else that will help you expand your awareness further. Um, Totally. What, what, uh, Naminder, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on those yes. concepts? As I said earlier, it's your next lesson. So once you learn your lessons, you move on. And as you said, we do have an expiration date. Our number of breaths are limited. And, um, how many breaths we're going to have in a lifetime are written. So that is your period. Because remember, time is only a concept on Earth. If you go outside Earth, the concept of time isn't there. It's something that we have created based on the revolutions of going around the sun and how the moon is going and affecting the days and nights. So mm -hmm. this concept we are in is, I mean, in effect, this whole world is false. It's an illusion. So, yeah. so we, we wake up from this illusion and discover the reality, which is not this this is just a learning yeah it's so the, the, the learning is the most important thing here yeah. hmm. i agree with that totally 100 percent. and in buddhism time is just a concept to measure motion because without motion there is no time that's all it's all it is <laughs> exactly. the tracking is, is a measure it's a, me it's a method of tracking motion pretty much hmm. yeah, motion exists without time but time doesn't exist without motion you know, it's so funny you say that, and, and I, it totally dawned on me, um, that, that connection. I, I've sort of been thinking about it just from a different point of view. So um, this goes, goes into the realm of, of physics, mm -hmm. uh, specifically relativistic physics. So Einstein's uh, theory of special relativity, I believe, is, is beautiful because it does it – does, it does one thing. It shows us how to find the relationship between two things. So the relationship between space and time uh, allows us to unify that as sort of the, I'll just call it the fabric of uh, our reality. And it's, it's, the, uh, it's, it's the where and the when. And if you uh, it, it's, it's also, you could say it's the, the here and the now. And if you, if you flip those two words, now you have the now and the here. And then if you combine those words, now you have nowhere. nowhere. So, right. so yeah. we are all nowhere in particular, and we're all experiencing nothing specific. So the whole concept of, of nothing, oh my gosh, that's like one of my favorite things to talk about because it has everything to do with sort of uh, the source of everything. So nothing is just simply another way of saying nothing physical, nothing in particular, and nothing matters because it is seemingly the source of everything. And I, I like to view things also from a standpoint of mathematics. Um, zero 
is approximately equal to one because it is, um, I mean, just, just thinking about what that is. So zero uh, by many is understood to be both a real and imaginary number. And I found a third function of zero and it's very simple. Uh, if you take a calculator and you can do it either with a handheld calculator, you can do it as a cell phone app, you can do it on the computer and you take any number and it doesn't matter what the number is and you divide it by zero, you'll get one of three answers. You will get um, invalid function. You might see uh, the statement can't divide by zero. And then you will also, if you do this exercise on a computer, it will say undefined. So all of those three answers are actually partially true. So the word undefined, I believe, is the, the most accurate uh, answer because it is our ability and opportunity and joy, hopefully, to better define our reality by accepting that there are going to be things that are undefinable, immeasurable, uh, mm -hmm. things that anything that you cannot quantify. So, so quantum mechanics in particular is the ability to quantify physical reality on a subatomic level. That's just sort of a, a basic uh, uh, summation of what quantum mechanics is. Um, what, what, quantum mechanics and, and really physics and all science does not seem to do is qualify why these processes exist. Why, why do humans exist? So, so the philosopher in me is more concerned with asking the question, why does it exist? And then if I can answer that question, then I will be able to reverse engineer all the how, what, when, where's, and even who's to a point of whatever level of certainty I want to be comfortable with. So as we proceed with these adventures that we are all experiencing, yeah, we do want to be more certain of our reality. I believe the only thing that a human being is ever capable of being absolutely certain of is how they are currently feeling. So that sounds sort of counterintuitive because feelings, you, you cannot measure them, but you can certainly detect them. You can do so through pattern recognition. You know how you are currently feeling. So let me ask, let me ask David first. And, and, and All right. I want you to feel free to answer however you want. Oh, I've been I've been answering freely. David, so how? Yeah. I know, I know, I know. I, I like to state the obvious sometimes. Uh, David, right, yeah. how are you? How do you currently feel? How do I currently feel at this present moment? Relaxed, peaceful, um, pretty, um, a sense of enjoyment from just being in this Zoom conversation. So awesome. because I, I I enjoy explaining you know uh, Buddhism to everybody. I. I post Buddhist articles in so many groups, <laughs> even though I get very little likes and very people, uh, a lot of people, most people just actually just skip right over it. It's, it is very complex for the, you know, for anyone to actually, to begin to understand if you're not familiar with uh, Buddhist concepts or culture, you know, you don't know where to begin, <laughs> but you, I mean, you begin somewhere because one thing leads to another. You can also backtrack and come back and, you know, revisit the things that you've uh, you've uh, misunderstood or misinterpreted. You know, there's a lot of misinterpretation going on and when you study sacred texts, even actually not non-sacred texts too. I mean, it's just because the reading in itself, because the definition, when you read something in description, sometimes the definition is not always provided uh, within that statement. So you kind of have to look it up on dictionary.com or something. I, I do that a lot. Hey, I don't know every word in the dictionary. I know enough to conversate and explain and elaborate and articulate things. That's about it, you know. Um, so how things come into existence, why things come into existence. Well, like I said, it's craving. 
Now, when you crave, it creates these energies in the subatomic, the micro level, beyond micro level, okay? This is all happening in the non-physical. So craving is actually creating these energies. It creates the, uh, the simulation or not, not the simulation. It creates the environment and conditions for things to come into existence. These are energies. Craving is an, a strong energy, very strong. Desire is a very strong energy. Desire in Buddhism is uh, identified as heat or fire. Because when you lust after something, you know, something down there heats up, you already know the sensation of that, right? So it's, it's uh, identified and affiliated with heat and fire. Hi, oh, my kids are home. Yep. So that's, uh, that, so if you want to, uh, you know, kind of contemplate that, why things come into existence, well, it's the energy behind all our feelings. Awesome. Fields. Yeah. You guys hopefully recognize the sound fields and the word feel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Naminder, how are you currently feeling in this present moment? Um, happy and intrigued. And I think I'm, I'm always like, I like to learn and see how people are also approaching different things, especially like the spirituality. And, you know, when you mentioned science and spirituality, I did message you and I said, it's usually something that doesn't fit well with it, with each other, the word science and spirituality. But how do you quantify consciousness is something that I've been going through because scientifically it's almost impossible because it's something a person feels mm -hmm. and experiences and how can you quantify that experience yourself you can only experience it yourself and tell somebody about it and so I can tell you how I'm feeling but only I really know truly how I'm feeling inside yeah so, you can only you can only um uh, express yeah to the best of your ability That's how right. you are currently feeling I I cannot know for absolute certainty, anything other than how I feel. Now, I sort of have a feeling, an idea, and can imagine how you are perceiving reality as do I have the same ability to uh, begin to understand and, and believe that I have some knowledge as to how David feels. So uh, I, I, I'm also the first to admit what I don't know. I don't know everything. I only actually know for absolute certainty one thing at a time. So every moment is the opportunity to experience reality from my point of view so that I can do one thing, know more. So um, I'm writing about consciousness. I'm, I'm currently writing... Uh, a total of 10 books. I finished my first trilogy called Sight, Sound, Spirit. And my first book is called Why Are We Here on Earth? And that's going to be um, released uh, as a paperback um, in mid-June, I believe. Sweet. In, in any case, um, I'm super excited because, uh, oh, you know, my, my whole thing about consciousness is that um, we can take a scientific approach to better understanding it. I, I just finished up um, a, a three-part series called um, Consciousness uh, is the Fifth Fundamental Force. I've also written about how consciousness is a state of matter. I talk about consciousness um, as being streams of causation, causal streams. I've spoken about consciousness as being a dimension. So the, you know, when people talk about the fifth dimension, what are they talking about? I believe they're talking about consciousness. So yeah. what I'm doing is I'm taking a, a, a logical uh, approach by finding the connections, but I'm trusting my intuition along the way. So when I post something, I pay attention to the responses. Now, sometimes I'll post what I feel is uh, a scientifically based um, research article, 
And yet there are still people that will say, oh, this is, this is pseudoscience, this is metaphysics, this doesn't belong here, blah, 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 blah. So, so then I obviously did not clarify my position well enough for them to understand. However, learning has to be a, a process of absorption and you have to be willing to receive the information. If you're closed-minded and you say to yourself, oh no, um, your information has no value, then you're, you're going to decide not to participate in the conversation. And that's perfectly okay too. I, again, I'm not here to tell people what to think, uh, what I think they should believe in, nor what I believe that they should feel about reality. It's, it's more about how to show people that they have the ability to trust their feelings and to have faith in things that maybe they cannot see and yet they can feel. So um, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to ask Naminder to sort of uh, wrap up uh, today's conversation. Um, what did you, what did you learn? What are your takeaways and where, where do you go from here? Um, just before I do that, I had something, I wasn't sure I was going to add or not, but, and this is through meditation and experience. So when you experience some higher levels of consciousness, you actually, get to tap into other people's levels of consciousness yes definitely. and so when you do that you can actually feel what they're feeling yep yep i and, agree yeah so oh, so the perception and the feeling that we're talking about you can actually achieve that but because what you're doing is you're you're connecting with such a higher level of energy and you you're tapping in so yeah, David, go on. Oh, uh, I agree with you 100. percent I was just gonna say that before we ended too. Like, you can feel other people's energies, even as we're speaking to each other right now. I feel Naminder's energy. I feel your mm -hmm. energy. Yeah. Even mm -hmm. through text, you know. I like, agree. Like in in a scientific term or uh, physical terms, we're quantumly entangled, even just by thinking of the person. That's mm -hmm. the word you you used it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that's it in, in spirituality, in Buddhism, Sikhism, the Dharmic yeah. religion. If you think of the person, you're already connected, you're connecting with the person already. So be careful when you think of the person, do not think of anything false or negative. <laughs> you don't yeah. want to send bad energy, you know, because Correct. people there are some people that are aware of this, you know, that they're aware that they're they're being uh, they're receiving or being transmitted thoughts from other people or other beings. You know, they feel it automatically. It's a sensation. It's a type of energy and you have to be really in touch and very observant of, you know, all your subtle differences in your auras and energies pretty much to, to be able to distinguish and qualify it. It's, you know? it's stillness is how I describe it. When you achieve yeah. stillness of mind, mm -hmm. then everything comes through. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So, so let me sum up today. Sorry, a bit off topic, but let's sum up. Um, I think it's been great. Thank you for hosting Michael and David in the conversation. Um, what have I learned is, yes, yeah, science can somewhat define spirituality, and it's. I don't think it's ever going to get all the way because of perception and the person, how they're looking and seeing things. But there is a lot to be learned from the science aspect and the spiritual aspect and combining it together to help enhance your knowledge. So that's what I'm taking away. Awesome. Awesome. David, what is your final thoughts on today's conversation? Very good. Another great discussion. This is my second Zoom meeting with you, and thank you for having me again. Uh, it's an honor and pleasure, and especially to be with Naminder too. Um, he's he's also in my groups. I'm in his groups, and we're all. I think, yeah, I'm in I'm in your groups. I don't know if Naminder's in, your group, but you know he'll probably join soon. It's, it's it was a great discussion today. We yeah. we uh, discuss uh, we discussed a lot of different topics that needed clarification. You know, for 
the masses, for the viewers, those that are interested. And yeah. a lot of your videos have been getting a lot of attention now, Michael. So cool. I think it's very good information for these viewers to um, absorb and contemplate and try to make sense out of. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having us. Yeah. Awesome. It's my pleasure. It's been an honor and a joy to uh, interact with both of you gentlemen. Um, I was thinking uh, about the word observer and observant. Uh, when you are an observer, you are serving. Yeah. And observant is to be a servant. So we're all doing that. Whether we're aware of it or not, we're all basically obtaining information. We're processing it. We're making sense out of it to the best of our ability, to the best of our knowledge um, and, and, and awareness. And when we reach a point, an apex of, let's say, the collective consciousness um, deciding that there's a better way. And when I say better, I mean smoother, more peaceful. We don't have to fight. We don't have to argue. We, don't, we certainly don't have to hate one another. What we can do is learn how to just simply love one another. Hmm. And that is, that is seemingly such a challenge for people. Uh, I had this conversation with, with somebody that posted um, an article about somebody who wrote a book that seemingly is promoting pedophilia. And just that word is going to trigger a lot of people. Yeah. Um, we all know that that sort of activity occurs. We know that people violate other people and children in many different ways, including sexually. And it's it's such a, a, a violation of the innocence of that being that we also are aware of how destructive it is. What we don't know is what would cause somebody to do such a thing. We have to understand and be aware that everybody does what they do because of how they feel about the reality if they are living in a state of of terror and fear because of an experience that they went through they are going to try to make sense out of it and in some cases even reenact those experiences and take it a step further and maybe even promote that activity as being okay and acceptable and it, it's not obviously it's not our job to do anything other than love that person we don't have to judge them. We have causality or, or, or karma, you know, wh whatever, whatever word resonates with you. Um, it, it's, it is a, a series of cause and effects. And another word for an effect is consequence. We don't have to look at consequence necessarily as being a form of punishment. Think of it as a gift. If, for example, I do something that deep down I know I shouldn't do. And I experience the consequence of that action. Do I learn from it or do I make the same mistake and then act surprised and wonder why am I being punished? So we create our reality because of what we wish to experience. Reality doesn't happen to us it actually happens for us. So that's, good way to look at that's, that's where that's that's where I am um, mentally. That's um, all occurring in my consciousness. I use my imagination to sort of, you know, add the, the fairy yeah. dust and the unicorns and you More know whatever yeah. whatever images make sense to me and my creation. So I am currently creating exactly the reality that I wish to experience. 
and I am going to aspire to inspire others to do the same for themselves. And when you learn something new and you feel compelled to share it, maybe you're sharing it in a poem. Maybe you're sharing it in a piece of music that you compose. Maybe you're, you're expressing yourself by painting. No, I want to take you. Go oh, ahead. Sorry. Sure. I'll, go ahead. Go finish first. Um, no, no, no. Um, I, I, I just, I just wanted to say that yeah. every action is an expression of how you feel about reality. What, what were you going to ask, David? I wanted to ask uh, you a personal question. Where are you at sure. in terms of faith and spirituality? Where, what do you subscribe to currently? Is there any one faith or is it a combination or fusion of many? Uh, it's, um, it's currently uh, a fusion of the teachings of Christ, Buddhism, and Taoism. However, uh, as I learn more about it's, Sikhism, it's, Okay. Um, and also Hinduism and even Islam. I'm, I'm finding things that are uh, valuable, pieces of information that, and again, information, uh, it, information does one thing. It transforms you and it's there for your benefit. Now, if you choose, for example, to say, oh, all religions are bad, they're man-made, and therefore there's no value in, let's say, the information. How do you obtain the information? What's the best way to obtain the information? You could do it actually one of two ways. You could either read the sacred text or you could have a conversation with somebody that seems to have a very deep understanding and knowledge of those concepts. So where am I? I'm exactly where I need to be. I, I am in a uh, almost constant state of peacefulness, in which I actually appreciate the disturbances now as means to better understand something about myself. I, I don't have to understand why others do what they do because I've experienced enough to know why people do the things that they do. Why do people behave the way that they do? Why are people choosing to be in a state of... Um, enslavement as it were because it's simple they are comfortable with not taking responsibility for their own consciousness and this is why we find uh many people um are perfectly content being indebted to let's say a a, a government or the pharmaceutical industry or even mainstream media now I am also learning that attachment, one of, I, I believe, the most important thing that I have gathered from Buddhism is that we can become attached to anything. It doesn't have to be a physical thing. It doesn't, um, you know, it could be an idea uh, and even a belief and or emotion. And once we learn that attachment to anything, anything that you can think of, actually already exists maybe not in the physical realm it may not have manifested yeah. but every realization is the possibility of a creation a thought turns into a belief which turns into an idea or a vision of the reality that that creator is going to manifest it's only a matter of time and yeah. i feel like the tides are turning it feels you know uh, i feel like I am, the deeper I go with all of these things, the more at peace I am because I've, I've already suffered enough. Yeah. Suffering is necessary until it is no longer necessary. What, what do you think about that, David? Absolutely. If suffering will continue until you realize what the cause of suffering is. You know, that there's no other way around it. You're going to continue to, <laughs> some people experience this all the way to <laughs> old age, okay? I, I know some of these people, I'm not going to go f further into that, but we, I think we all know similar people in our lives, you know, in all walks of life, in every country, in every society. So exactly, yeah, you're going to experience suffering until you realize what the cause of the suffering is coming from. And it comes from you 
go deep enough, it comes from your own mind. Then your own mind dictates however you speak and however you move. So it's 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 the beginning of uh, suffering and beginning of the ending of it too, pretty much. I, I uh, want to bring up two more concepts. Um, and I would like for both of you to, I know I said I was going to conclude, but um, this is just too interesting to me. Um, okay, two, two concepts. The first concept is simple. Suffering is a choice. Yep. Okay. Um, the second concept and I've, I've received a, a plenty of uh, backlash with both of these concepts. The second concept is we deserve however we are currently feeling. Yeah. Exactly. So, Positive so yeah, yeah. Uh, Naminder, what's your take on those two concepts? And just take it away. Well... I agree with them straight away because these are the, some of the things as part of my mental health awareness work. We are in charge of our own life and our own thought process and our own thinking. So if we're suffering, if we can identify the cause of that suffering and stop that suffering by not letting that thing affect us anymore. So if it's a family member who's doing it to you, you unfortunately have to cut away from them. If it's something at work, if it's um, jobs getting you down, you change your job. Whatever the cause is, by removing that cause, making that decision yourself, you remove your suffering. And um, what was the other one? Remind me. Um, you deserve however you are currently feeling. Yeah, because because of the decisions that you've made, you deserve to feel like that. Because if you've decided I'm going to go out today and I'm going to have a nice day and I'm going to go to a park and enjoy myself, you deserve to feel good because you've made a good choice. If you've decided to go and meet someone who you don't like or put yourself in a bad situation, you deserve to feel bad because you chose to do that. 100%. And you are in charge of exactly what you're doing all the time. And snap out of it is is how I listen. Snap out of it. The, the thing that jumped into mind um, specifically, actually with both, uh, is the idea that, oh my gosh, how can you say those things? What you're saying is that children choose to suffer and children deserve to suffer? No. So, so David, David, what what is... What is your take on the two concepts? And I'm going to restate them um, for the audience uh, as well. Um, yeah. Suffering is a choice. Yes. And secondly, we deserve however we are currently feeling. So take it away on both of those concepts. Okay. Suffering is definitely a choice because everything that we experience, it stems from our own decision and it starts in the mind. What happens in the minds uh, is later on reflected through speech and physical action, whether you know it or not. You won't, I mean, as when you're young, you're probably not gonna notice this because uh, you don't know how the how the mind functions. You don't know, I mean kids don't know that. Not, you're not innocent. Till, exactly. Now uh, you deserve what, uh, exactly what you what's the other one again? I'm sorry. Um, so <laughs> So, so uh, the first one is suffering is a choice. And the second one is you deserve however you are currently feeling. Yes, exactly. A hundred percent. You chose it. Now, I mean, now this is a very uh, hot subject when, when, when we discuss this, because, you know, some people like to bring up, oh, what about this kid? You know, he got abused and raped, you know, by his right. parents and this and that. Well, it, in Buddhist psychology, this goes back, this ties into previous lives, okay? Um, everything that you experience has everything to do with your previous actions, and this goes on to previous lives. So if you're born into uh, a family that's not so, uh, well, 
not that's not so well off mentally and emotionally is probably because you deserve it from the previous actions of your previous lives okay um and you probably did something similar in your previous life that you are now experiencing now in your new current life that's that's mm -hmm. the chain of thought and how karma works because karma spans many lifetimes when we speak of karma so exactly exactly everything you get everybody gets what they deserve whether it's good or bad that's karma mm -hmm. yeah. and the key awesome. is I... acceptance is what okay. the key for Sikhism especially is acceptance accept accept Ex what acceptance. you have been yes. yeah, acceptance yeah accept that if the times are good you accept yeah. it and you're happy if the times are bad you accept it and you'll be happy i love that yeah. I came up, I came up with a, a saying a couple of weeks ago. And first of all, the reason why I came up with it is because I did not resonate. I do not resonate with this statement and you probably have heard of it. Um, and that is ignorance is bliss. Um, now yeah. it's not, here's why. Innocence is bliss. Yes. Ignorance is the abyss. So when you steal the innocence of a child, for example, you are being extremely ignorant. And you will, through those actions, feel the consequences. Now, you may or may not, let's say, go to prison however you will be creating uh, a a form of hell of your own making that is going to persist it's going to follow you it's going to torment you and it's not meant to punish you unless you view yourself as needing to be punished. So a lot of people get stuck in the idea of this victimhood. Oh, I'm feeling punished. Uh, you know, God must not love me. Uh, you know, this reality sucks, so on and so forth. And what's interesting to me is that it's always a matter of willingness. When you reach a point to where you're sick and tired of feeling that way then go back to one of my favorite uh, passages in the bible matthew 7 7 ask and ye shall, shall receive seek and ye shall find knock and the door will be open so ask what are you asking for ask just ask for guidance mm -hmm. what are you seeking seek the truth you don't have to seek anything else just seek the truth and then what is being opened well, the, the door of perception is going to be how you receive the information, beginning with your five basic senses, each have receptor cells that have to absorb the light. And then it's going to convert that signal into whatever language is going to resonate with the consciousness that is processing the information. So we're all being observant we are all existing for a reason we're, we're all part of, of the universe obviously or we wouldn't exist so once we get past the confusion of thinking that we need to judge others um, we're going to feel a lot more peacefulness and happiness because we don't need to carry those burdens not even god or the creator, or the universe, whatever you view the one to be is exactly what is designed for you to have a very unique relationship with that entity, that being. Mm -hmm. And that's why there are 8 billion human spirits, all uniquely qualified to perceive reality in their own manner. And basically report back to the source of everything so it's really an exchange it's a symbiotic relationship and it's perfect it's intricate it's beautiful 
Um, and it's also as complicated or chaotic as we choose to view it. So we create the complexity and it's up to us. Do we, do we like resolving problems um, where we actually end up releasing more dopamine? Awesome, then get to work. <laughs> if, you, if you learn how to appreciate and not get attached to that particular hormone, um, then what happens is you will find uh, that there is a way to connect through the pineal gland. You can release your own DMT. Uh, many cultures are not many. Um, there, there are some uh, cultures that understand uh, the concept of Kundalini rising. Um, there's a way to uh, also release micro doses of DMT through breathing exercises. Um, uh, the act of meditation and, and not just the, the one where you focus on your breathing, although that one's great there. Mm -hmm. And David, I know, you know, a, a lot more about the, the chanting uh, practice than I do. Uh, it all has to do with sound and not just physical sound, but the inner sound, the inner peace and the stillness. Naminder, you used the word stillness earlier. I, it, it's, it's finding that your position, your reason for being the point of your existence is to exchange this energy and just go with the flow, learn how to let go. So that the, uh, the acceptance is going to occur when you let go and you surrender. So when yeah. the, uh, the idea that surrendering is, is a sign of weakness, no, it's not. It's, it's a sign of courage. It takes, it takes courageous levels of faith to surrender to your own existence in order to then share what you know. When, when you've gone through all of the trials and tribulations and experiences that have been painful and pleasurable, you know, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and then you can come out of it intact as a whole being. And, you know, even the idea, and, and uh, I think maybe the next time um, we, and, and, and I would like to have this same group to discuss more about mental health issues. Um, one of the things to understand, and, and I'm gonna leave, uh, both of you guys conclude, uh, it is um, getting to a point in time where I need to actually run an errand. Um, there is a difference between crazy and insanity. So crazy is confused. I am not confused. I'm perfectly clear. I'm perfectly lucid. I am inside of my own sane mind. So I am actually perfectly insane because I'm in sync with my reality, my imagination, and it's all sort of working together. Um, Naminder, give me your final thoughts on whatever you want to talk about. Um, I think I'd just love to carry on. And I, I was going to throw a little spanner in, but we'll save this for the next one, which is going to maybe make you think even from another point of view, and it's it's the creator's theory. It's a very deep concept. And I think exploring more about the creator and the perception and why are we here, what we're going through collectively. And I always like to leave on the word of love. Love is the strongest emotion and the most felt emotion. And we are all connected all together with the oneness and that runs through all of us we are experiencing in different ways mm -hmm. and so i'm gonna leave it there with the little there thank right. you <clears throat> uh yep i'll pick up where you left off yeah i just want to leave it at um don't get too attached to this physical world don't get too attached to your physical body because and this is probably a topic for another day of discussion but if you notice when we dream, we can't feel the temperature, okay? You, you, you can't feel uh, physical senses. That's a spiritual realm. 
And that's how that, that, that's that, exactly how, how some of these higher realms are. Some of these senses don't exist, but you already know it's a, it's a state of bliss. So don't get too attached to anything physical in this world, because we as humans that we live right now, it's very short lived. This this existence on Earth, okay. Where you're going next is dependent on your current actions. So hopefully everybody be good, do good, respect everybody, try to help everybody as much as possible. Giving information, giving them the truth, like the Dharma, is actual very good help. It transforms people. So whatever you do from here on out, try to transmute. And thank you for having us. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, I I love uh, everything that you gentlemen have spoken about. It has resonated with me. Um, and as you were talking about this last uh, idea of not getting too attached to the physical body, I realized, and I got the chills uh, and, and, and I'm getting the chills just thinking about it. Not for even one second did I have any physical sensations other than my sight and my sound during the entire presentation today. So that was like, woo, mind blown. So it comes time to recognize that each of our senses are relevant when they are meant to be experienced. And I'm just going to say mahalo nui loa. Uh, that's um, Hawaiian for thank you very much and um, namaste. Thank you. All right. Ciao, guys. All right.